are the Pump House Gang, and what is the Pump House? It is the site of the 1892 lockout and strike. And this handsome group are indeed the Pump House Gangsters. In the course of this video, we will see a variety of presentations that were made possible by the efforts and cooperation of members of the gang. myself and my background so you know what we're doing. I'm, I'm a professionally, I've spent my life as a university geography professor with the historical interests of historical geography as we say. I'm used to working in the field, in places, on the ground, teaching there. Uh, and when I run a field trip, we cover a lot of ground, walk fairly fast. Happily for you, I've got a back problem at the moment, so that slows me down somewhat. The guide here was professor of geography, retired from the University of Liverpool, Paul Laxton, here speaking to a group of theater students from Pitt. There may be people here, you pick me up on things. I'm not omniscient about this. I'm broadly familiar with it. Um, and uh, I think the best way, way I haven't got a, a route really worked out because I you know, numbers, and as soon as we set off, we'll end up as a long crocodile, and so we re can really only talk when we get to stopping points. So, I thought before we go, I would ask you if there's any particular locations that involve your character. But there isn't enough pollution around now. <laughs> They've cleaned up the air, this is not all that much comes out of ET compared with old stuff. The result is that these hillsides where nothing had grown, there's now trees, which is nice, except that when you want a good view with a camera, they're always in the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only area where all five major railroads of the northeast pass through. You'll find no others, you draw a circle. No, no other That's place right. in the United States had all five major railroads. Yeah. Or to put it another way, you know, a really huge proportion, I don't know anyone's ever calculated, but huge proportion of the Midwest industrial output comes through here, going through to the east. And, it, and, and if you read the novel, it is a major, major thing.
please. This is the first chapter of part three of the book. They buried her heart with her. She couldn't imagine wanting to go on living, yet this was the way it was. After the return from the cemetery, after the last friend had gone, she had to cook supper for the children and put them to bed. And in the morning, she had to get up and make the fire and send the children off to school. Nor could the washing be put off any longer. The company had her sign a release in full and gave her a check for $1,300. Joe, trying to recall the exact terms of the company's accident compensation plan, thought she should have received more. Mike's Lodge paid a $500 death benefit, all of which went for funeral expenses, masses for the dead, and a four grave plot, excellently situated near the chapel in a newly open section of the cemetery. The gravestone she chose was a granite column surmounted by the triple cross of the Greek Catholic Church. On it was carved Michael L. Dobrechek, born December 8, 1875, died March 7, 1914. The L was for Ludwig, after an uncle who had died in some forgotten war. But if you look at this photograph I have here, and you you have it, and those of you, two of you, have got this bunch that was done for me um, in the library. There is a, a picture in there, if I can just find it without dropping all this, of, one of those. Tony, um, who Dave knew pretty well, um, Thomas's brother. standing at the grave with his wife when the cross was still on the, one of his colleagues in the Union. I can't quite think. Grauji. Grauji. That's it. Um, and they, they, they part. And they finish the conversation. And then the last paragraph, this is page 312, goes like this. It says, They parted in front of the 5 and 10, which I pointed out, remember? Uh, uh, <coughs> was at the foot of Library Street, in the very heart of town. Uh, Grouchy going on to Ninth, Dobie turned moodily up Library. So the fact that you've walked it, when you read that passage, yeah. you know you know that Grouchy was walking towards uh, uh, Good Shepherd because he was going on to Ninth. Okay, Dobie goes up the hill. Beyond the Pennsylvania uh, Railroad underpass. A gloomy stone tunnel, I think we would agree, with the station on its top side. It was Jones Avenue. Further along, the mill superintendent's mansion. Mm -hmm. A large, ugly pile with a covered carriage entrance and a glass conservatory in the back, squatted amid leafless shrubbery and black dripping trees. Dobie turned right at Summer Street, glancing into the windows of the police station as he passed and as usual, seeing nothing of interest. He followed the street to its end, a street of shabby frame houses and wet vacant porches. Past the pavement's end, the earth underfoot was spongy. Down the hillside, to his right, lights gleamed in the midst, mist above the town. He closed the gate behind him and strode towards the kitchen. Inside it, Julie's voice stopped suddenly, and Dobie knew she had heard his footsteps on the walk. the importance of what this means to Pittsburgh so that it can be celebrated on the levels that it has been intended to do. 
and I, that's Charlie and Peter and I have been talking about a strategy that will help us to clarify and designate the spirit of the piece so that it's acknowledged up front as to what it represents. So, you know, once my work is done, it's, it's no longer really an art piece. It's more of a, a civic reminder and reflection of, of where we come from and how important Pittsburgh is uh, in, in essentially building the world and the Industrial Revolution. So <laughs> it took us a little over two years. <laughs> Eric says seven. <laughs> yeah. Eric's our engineer, so yeah, yeah, I saw it right away. <laughs> like your old one. Any fact checking will go to Eric. Yeah. Um, but we, it took us about two and a half years to build this. This piece. is Eric. This is Eric. And you're I'm Tim. Tim. Um, and we did that all on volunteer time. We raised additional funds through the Heinz Endowments, which was our first sort of leg up on the project that paid us as laborers, and we were able to knock this guy out and half the time because we designated more manpower and focused energy on it. All of the materials are resalvaged materials. The beams that make up the men came from the hot metal bridge when it was renovated, and this goes back 10 years ago. So the, the beams themselves and the metal that decorates the men, which we call armor or safety gear, that armor came from the the boiler plant of the JNL electric furnaces across the river, which was the last building to be torn down on that site. So that window of the difficulty of that part of the plant gave us a chance to salvage some of that material before it was uh, recycled. The funny thing now, the frustrating thing earlier, was we would get all of this free material, but then the, the complications become in managing it and moving it. So the I-beams and the scrap material went from the south side at the brew house and it moved around a couple different places there. Then it went to Lawrenceville. And I think it came back to the south side and then came here. So we, we moved stuff around for two or three years before we got some traction. Uh, but it helped us to sort of make the case for the, pr the project and refine the idea a little bit. So in terms of uh, fabricating, the pieces. We, I could show you some miniatures. We have miniature men of uh, the sculptures made of I-beams. But we first started making full-scale plywood models. And if you look at in the back corner, there's a cobbled together wooden man made of plywood. Even though we have an engineer on staff, we, we did not produce blueprints like a conventional builder might. And then make all of the cuts and all of the layouts in, in sequence. We made, when actually we made the pieces one piece of it at a time so in sequence. Each of, figure there's, I think, 11 or 12 pieces in I-beams and some complementary. Uh,
about Tom Brown and I said Jimmy Nelson. So what are you talking about, 1950 or so? Yeah. Well, I knew Jimmy fairly well and then going to the UA convention in the 80s. That's what I was saying here. I mean, I came up with a little bit of a
Out of sight, out of mind Under the table The only decent work I can find Running on empty With no safety net I'm never catching up Forever in debt Dunking and running From the IRS Working off the books Trying to survive Doing what it took Just to stay alive For every three of us that look There's only one job I'm one of the two left out In this doggy dog Under the table Of the statistical charts Under the table From unreported parts Trapped in the cracks What they call recovery Invisible down in the underground economy The American dream Just a distant memory Under the table wasn't my choice Under the table I got no advocate or voice In a world of indecision You do what you must There ain't no politicians Speaking for us All across this nation There's millions of us Under the table Under the table Available to neighbor I'm under the table I'm under the table Thank you. 
sentimental journey Gonna set my heart at ease Gonna make a sentimental journey To renew old memories Got my bag, got my reservation Spent each dime I could afford Like a child in wild anticipation Long to hear that all aboard Seven, that's the time we leave at seven I'll be waiting up for Takes me back Never thought My heart could be so yearning Why did I decide to roam Gotta take that sentimental journey Sentimental journey
Free Speech in Homestead, Civil Liberties Then and Now, a weekend conference and state historical marker dedication. Sad thing, but what the hell? <laughs> Who's got the power? We got the power. Never die, ain't it, Mel?
marker dedication program by asking uh, Don Green of Christian Associates to come up and to give the invocation for this joint program with the two markers. Don? Thank you. Let us pray. God of liberty and justice, we remember your servants of old. Moses, who stood firm against Pharaoh in defense of the enslaved Hebrew laborers. Deborah, who led your people in the way of love of neighbor as they took possession of the promised land, and the prophets who called for justice at the gate and righteousness in the marketplace. We give you thanks for women who stood with courage of Moses, the bold leadership of Deborah, and the passion for justice of Amos and Hosea. For the witness of Mother Mary Jones, Francis Perkins and Fanny Seelan, we give you thanks. As we remember their witness for laborers and their families, help us to recommit our lives to stand like Moses against the oppressive pharaohs of our day for safety in the workplace, fair compensation and needed benefits for our families. Recommit our lives to lead our union members and citizens in love of neighbor and the alleviation of human need. Help us to recommit our lives to demand justice at the shores and borders of our country for immigrants seeking liberty and justice in the marketplace so that care of workers and addressing the needs of communities might replace our obsession with bottom line, stockholder dividends and CEO perks. Help us to recommit ourselves so that we demand righteousness in boardrooms and in the halls of government. Blessed and dedicate be these markers to the remembrance of our sisters' labors. And as a token of our renewed commitment to liberty and justice for all your people. For we ask this in your one most holy name. Amen. It gives one an incredible feeling to be here in Homestead, in that Homestead which 80 some years ago people suffered with the 12 hour days, the lack of money, the lack of time, and the terrible oppression. And to realize today the suffering in this town the suffering in this community for lack of jobs, for lack of a way to live in justice and dignity. So we have to go back to Mother Jones because our society is going back to her time. She said, you pulling your belt while, the, while they banquet. They have stomachs two miles long and two miles wide. And you fill them. If Albert H. Gary from U.S. Steel wants to work 12 hours a day, let him go in the Bloomin' Mill and work. What we want is a little leisure, time for music, books, and the things that make life worthwhile. Listen to that, music, books. When we're stuck in this consumer society where young people's heads are filled with trivia, who know all of the movie and TV stars and all of that, and know nothing of this history, know nothing of the world around them, know nothing of the real suffering in our communities right here today. So it is important that this message of Mother Jones go out to the city, to the state, and to our nation, that we want to revive that spirit of struggle, of fight, that 
Mother Jones so well represents for all of us, men and women and children. We are all here together today and we must stay together. Ken Walensky, uh, member uh, historian for the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Ken? Thanks, Charlie. And on behalf of the Historical and Museum Commission, we're very pleased to be here today with the Lieutenant Governor and with both mayors and with the Pennsylvania Labor History Society to remember Mother Jones and the important work that she did here in, in the Mon Valley. As Charlie said, in, in just a few moments, we're going to walk over there and unveil that marker to Mother Jones. And I, I would ask you to think about something before we actually do that. And that is that, that many times we think that important history happens somewhere else, right? And I know my friends from the Labor History Society have heard me say this before, but many times we think that, say, important political history could have only happened in Washington, D.C. or in Harrisburg, for example. Or we think that important social history could have only happened in, in the country's great urban centers like New York or Philadelphia or perhaps on the West Coast. But if you look at Pennsylvania, the fact of the matter is, is that important history has happened all across this state. Important history that maybe you didn't always read about in the textbooks, but more and more in our age and in our time, that important history is being written about and talked about and commemorated and celebrated by organizations like the Pennsylvania Labor History Society. And that's what we're here to do today. When it comes to the history of labor, there are over 40 historical markers across Pennsylvania that commemorate labor. If you go to the northern tier of Pennsylvania, up in Tioga County, you'll see a historical marker there, a blue and gold historical marker to William Wilson, who was the first U.S. Secretary of Labor and who was from Pennsylvania. If you go to the anthracite region of Pennsylvania, you will see a series of historical markers there that commemorate the 1902 anthracite coal strike, the Latimer Massacre, Min Matheson, a very activist garment worker leader, if you come here to the Mon Valley, there are many historical markers that commemorate labor. And specifically, if you look at Mother Jones, there's a marker in front of City Hall in Philadelphia that commemorates the work Mother Jones did there in leading the march of the Kensington Mill children. There's a marker in Coaldale in Schuylkill County commemorating a march that Mother Jones led there in 1900. So the point is, is that these blue and gold markers, although we may see them and pass them along the road and maybe not pay much attention to them. What they help us to do is to give us a bookmark to recognize that important history happened all around us. And that's what we're here to do today in remembering the important work and the important legacy and history that Mother Jones had here in the Mon Valley. And we thank all of you for participating in this and, and for coming out and celebrating this today because it's very important that we celebrate, commemorate, and remember. And now I will ask these folks behind me to walk over with me to that marker to Mother Jones, and we will unveil it. And I would like to ask the, the mayor of Homestead to read the text aloud to us. Thank you. right here for speaking to striking steel workers in 1919. When a judge asked who gave her a permit to speak publicly, she replied, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. Adam.
keep in mind, like we do down at the pump house, that there's not many places in this country you can go and stand and say that's where history happened, at least in the labor movement. And this is, is an instance where you can do this. Just think of 70 years ago, Francis Perkins, Secretary of Labor, being over in that building, having a meeting, and then steel workers outside wanting to meet with her, and they are telling her, no, you can't meet here. And she wanted to go to the park, to no, you can't do that. You have to have a permit. And she looked and saw the flag at the post office. To my friends, let's come over here. This is federal property. I think we have some rights there. And it was a simple affirmation of the right of individuals to speak in dialogue about their concerns. So uh, we're going to have a brief program here, but everyone is meaningful. follow the police and go down and go across the, to the uh, Steelworker Organizing Committee uh, monument over by uh, Kyoto's or Chiotos, whichever you prefer, although Joe Joe is here. Where is Joe Kyoto? Kyoto. Where is he? He's here. I saw him. the uh, 1941 Steelworker Organizing Committee a Memorial and uh, to, here to introduce the folks that are going to speak to you is the Vice President of the Pennsylvania Labor History Society, George Pinky. George. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you. It's indeed an honor. It's indeed an honor to speak here this afternoon after a really splendid conference. Uh, I learned about Fanny Sellens in 1989 when the father on Senior Rice received the Mother Jones Award up in New Kensington. And I had a college professor say one time that the easiest way to be tall is to stand on the shoulders of other tall people. Indeed, when we commemorate the lives of people like Fanny Sellins, <coughs> Mother Jones, Secretary Perkins, we're talking about tall people. 
whilst I had the good fortune in my lifetime, not only stand alongside, but now on the shoulders of Brother John Brennan. And it's not hard to receive the necessary inspiration when we look at our labor heroes of art. I also had the good fortune of growing up in a home in the anthracite coal regions of eastern Pennsylvania, where not only was Pope Pius XII, John Mitchell, Franklin Roosevelt, honored and venerated, but at an early age, my father taught us about Mother Jones. Here, here. It's people like these that we have to reach to when we look around and we see what's going on. Their fight is now our fight, and we must press on. The District 10 Director of the United Steel Workers of America, John. Okay, then I'll add a little bit. Fanny Sellens was assassinated. Fanny Sellens was massacred. Fanny Sellens was killed with malice. Fanny Sellens was murdered premeditatively. Why? I can tell you why. Because she was good. She did her job. She fought for our civil rights. She fought for our right of assembly to have a union. She fought for our right of speech to be able to stand up and demand a decent living wage. To be able to say we should be able to work and help and safety conditions. To be able to stand up and say, we should be able to have a grievance procedure where we can petition our employer, our employer of our, of our concerns. She fought for our inalienable right to stand up and say, we demand fair treatment. Fanny Sellens gave her life for what we have today, to have the right to organize, to have our right of assembly, to have our right of speech, to have our right to petition our government for redress of our grievances. Yeah. Right. She fought for the common good. She fought for the general welfare. And she fought for our right to expect to be able to pursue our happiness. She is a giant among labor leaders. And we have a special responsibility. We have a re responsibility in 2003 to carry on her tradition and stand up to the George Bushes and the John Ashcrofts and say, we are going to fight for our civil rights, our human rights, our inalienable rights. And we have a responsibility to hand off to the next generation, just as Fanny Sellens did to this generation, a better life for all. Thank you. I uh, was privileged to the last two anniversaries of Fanny, Fanny Sullins to be at the gravesite and even meet uh, uh, Fanny's niece, uh, who I communicated with uh, several times since. And you get the feeling in Arnold, Pennsylvania, where she uh, is buried, that you are certainly on sacred ground. And you are inspired and encouraged by what she has done for all of us. So we want to gather our thoughts here and pray for the courage of women like Fanny Sellens and others that continue to give us leadership and give us hope. Let us pray that we have the courage and strength 
to continue the tradition of Francis Perkins, Mother Jones, and Fanny Sellins. And all the workers who suffered and died to have a voice at the workplace and a voice in the street. We are under assault these days and need to draw on our history and our traditions and our past. These last couple days have been inspiring because they remember our past and call us to remember, to celebrate, and to believe. These markers today are reminders to us to fight back, to speak out, to lobby, to vote, and work and declare we will not go backwards. We will do what is necessary to keep these rights that have been won through the sacrifices of others over the years. And we pray now in solidarity with workers throughout our country and throughout our world. And we give special thanks this weekend to our Labor History Society and all those who made this weekend possible. Their continual efforts to remind us that we will never, never go back and we will not forget our rich history. We thank you for all good gifts. In your name, together we say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. And now, I'm going to lead us in song and entertain us. Another inspiring and brave woman, be it at the top of the Hilton in Pittsburgh, on the picket line, in the tavern in South Bethlehem, or wherever, who, like Mother Jones, not only likes, but knows how to raise hell. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try it higher. Keep high In labor's glorious history was many union made. Sounds good again. Stop. Well, there I go. <laughs> In labor's glorious history was many a union made who stood up to the bosses so staunch and unafraid. Molly Jackson, Mother Jones fought for a better way. But let's sing a Fanny Sellins and remember her today. All over Pennsylvania, Fanny spread the Union word. In the coal fields and the company towns, her voice of hope was heard. United we will bargain, but divided we must beg. Fanny Sellins spread the dreams of the UMWA. A widow with four children toiling 80 hours a week Found time to fight injustice and bring power to the meek She fought with tireless energy, no duty would she shirk Though murderers cut short her life, we carry on her work In the company slums of Ducktown in the summer of 19 an unarmed striking miner was gunned down by deputies. When Fanny cried out, spare his life, they shot her down as well. And hundreds watched in horror as this fearless woman fell. Now the men who gave the orders faced no charge of any sort. And the men who pulled the triggers were acquitted by the court. But when companies own the courthouse, justice fails for you and me. That's a thought worth dwelling on for a moment there, isn't it? I'm thinking back to Florida. Um, when companies own the courthouse, justice fails for you and me. So let's work like Fanny Sellins now for true equality. Yeah. Woo! A widow with four children toiling 80 hours a week found time to fight injustice and bring power to the meek. She fought with tireless energy, no duty would she shirk. Though murderers cut short her life, we carry on her work. Though murderers cut short her life, we carry on her work. Bright and early Sunday morning, October 5th, 2003, a group of regional history buffs met at Homestead Cemetery, high atop the highest hill overlooking the Monongahela Valley. Here are docents John and Linda Asmonga, Russell Gibbons, Rosemary Trump, and Charles McAllister, 
provided commentaries at the grave sites of the men who had fallen at the Battle of Homestead in 1892. One across the road directly from us. There's a second one a little further down the hillside. And then if you're coming back up, down here at the telephone pole in the cemetery, there's two of the fallen victims of the 1892 strike. And I didn't record everything in memory. They're all in the fly. Well, there would be three over there. Yeah. There's three. There's yeah. three in this one. There's three in the Because yeah. right over here is Morris. Right. Morris is the only brother named Thomas K. Reuter, who was a butcher. From, uh, also from Chartiers, Westmoreland County. Uh, their unit was, uh, it was like a temporary unit in that they had the shortest period of enlistment of anyone known at that time, nine months. So at the time of Fredericksburg, they were toward the end of their enlistment at the time they, you know, went into battle. They went, you know, from being civilians into the major battles, you know, of the war. And uh, after he you know, finished his enlistment, which ended in uh, 1865. We're not exactly sure, you know, where he came, whether he came, you know, to live in Homestead um, and work here or, you know, where. But we know that he's buried in uh, what's called Bethel Cemetery, and the name got changed to Glade View. First of all was Johnny Morris. 28-year-old immigrant from Wales and a popular upstanding union mainstay who did skilled work in the blooming mill. Morris was among those workers who had taken a position on the pump house that overlooked the wharf. From there he had been firing on the barges and, he believed, had laid low one of the Pinkertons. During a momentary pause in the battle, Morris tried to sneak a look. He himself was then laid low, a single bullet piercing his forehead and knocking him off the pump house into a ditch 60 feet below. Morris cried out as he fell to his death. The sight of his mangled body horrified his companions who immediately carried him back to his home on Ninth Avenue. It was the death of Morris and the procession to his house, where his widow and children received him, that catapulted the rage of the townspeople to new heights. The killing of Morris seemed to craze the people, and men, women, and children ran through the streets, crying revenge and for blood. 